Okay, welcome to this lecture on basic surveying. We are now talking about this module 12 and this module 12 is on GPS. Today is our lecture number 3. We have already completed two lectures of this module. So, this is our last lecture of this video lecture series. We have already completed this part which was the introduction to geoinformatics, basic concepts of surveying, linear measurements, compass surveying, theodolites and total stations, then these techniques of triangulation and trilateration, labeling and contouring, plane tabling, then how the observations can be adjusted. Finally, how we can obtain the maps. Then this is the setting out project surveys. We discuss how to set out the various projects. And in this present module, we are talking about the GPS and this is our last lecture now. In our last lecture of on this GPS, that is lecture number two, we talked about applications of GPS. Then we saw the GPS errors. Also, we saw how the errors can be eliminated by doing the differential positioning. Now, in this lecture today, we are going to talk about some measurement techniques which are code and carrier based measurement techniques by the GPS. We will also have a glance at types of the receivers and how the various types of receivers can be classified. Then a little bit about GPS survey approaches. How actually the GPS survey is carried out in the field? What are the various ways on that? Okay, so to begin with, we'll start with GPS measurement techniques. We know we have already done a little bit about the code based techniques. When we are using the code, you know, you will recall that in the very, very first lecture, we are talking about the pseudo random code, the code which is being generated by the satellite and is also being generated by the receiver. And this code is same at one point of time. Now, this code is being transmitted from the satellite and the same code is being generated by the receiver. But these, by the time the code reaches the receiver, and we compare the code which is coming from the satellite and the code of the receiver, they will be displaced in time. So, using this, the time of travel of the signal from satellite to the receiver was measured. So, that was the code based. So, very first way of doing this ranging is code based. There is one more way in which the ranging can be done, which is the carrier phase based ranging. And we will see this is more accurate. Why it is more accurate and how it is done, we will see that now. Well, first a little bit about again the code based measurement. We are using the pseudo random code and we are determining the pseudo range using the time of travel measurement and we need four pseudo ranges in order to find the location of receiver. Well, about the code, we have got two kinds of code. CA code, which this is available to civilian while P code, this is available with the military. Now, in the case of the CA code, as we had seen previously also, the frequency of CA code is 1.023 megahertz. That's the CA code. And the P code, its frequency is 10.23 megahertz. Now, what is the effect of this? If 
we convert these frequencies in corresponding wavelength. We'll find that the wavelength corresponding to CA is of order of 293 meter while for P it is 29.3 meter. Well again, what is the implication of this? Well the implication is, it is something like, as we can see, because we are made, making use of these codes in order to know our position. So what actually is happening there in this process? The signal which is coming from the satellite, let us say the signal which is coming from the satellite and that is the satellite which is sending the signal and the signal is being received there at the receiver. Receiver is also generating the same signal, though it is not sending it to satellite, it is generating internally. And then these two signals are being compared. So what is happening there? If the signal which is being generated is like this, how we will read this signal? We will read this signal as 1 not 1 1 not not 1 not 1 and not that kind of signal. Now this is the signal let us say which is generated by satellite and the same signal is also being generated by the receiver but these two signals will be slightly displaced in time as we are trying to do here. Now, here is the signal which is coming from satellite and here is the signal which is gen being generated by receiver. So what we see, these two signals are those same because what I did I just copied it here. So these two signals are same but the moment the signal from satellite reaches the receiver, the receiver is generating some other signal. So this is the edge which has reached at the moment but at, that, at the same time our receiver is generating this particular point. So what we see there is a displacement, the displacement of order of let us say this much. So this is the displacement in time. So because of this displacement, we observe this displacement and we convert it to the distance and this is how the pseudo range is computed. Now one thing, the accuracy of time measurement will depend upon what is the wavelength of the signal. If this wavelength is small, we can have better time measurement and the accuracy of pseudo ranging will be better. Now if we understand this, now we look at the signals for CA code and for P code. As in the P code, the wavelength is very small 29.3 in comparison to the CA code. The accuracy of P code is more. It is more accurate than the CA code. Now in the case of this code base ranging, what is done? Over here it is desirable to determine the position over here. Let us say the coordinates are ux, ui and uz. These are the coordinates of the point where our receiver is kept. At any time t, the satellites are at x, y, z, 1, that means x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, z2, x3, y3, z3, x4, y4, z4. These are the locations of the satellite and our aim is to determine ux, ui and uz. What we are observing? We are observing the pseudo ranges. P U1, 
PU2, PU3 and PU4. This is what we are observing. Also, let us say there is some error in the receiver which we are writing as DTU. So, DTU is the error in the receiver. Considering all these, we can write now as we can see here. I can write a relationship between the position ux, ui, uz, the coordinate of the satellite and the range and as well as the time error which is there in the satellite. How I can relate these? I can relate them by this relationship. What is this? x1 minus ux square, y1 minus uy square plus z1 minus uz square and square root of that, it is basically the distance between these two points. Plus I am adding c is the velocity of light and dtu is the clock bias at the receiver. So, this total is actually the range which is being observed. This is the pseudo range. This P1, PU1 is the pseudo range. Means the range with error. While this particular range, this particular value is the correct value. But we are adding the error component to this. That is why PU1 is the pseudo range. What we can do? We can write similarly for the second satellite, for the third satellite and for the fourth satellite. So, what we see in these four equations, if you consider these four equations, the unknowns here are ux, ui, uz and dtu. While we know where the satellites are. So, x1, x2, x3, x4, y1, y2, y3, y4, z1, z2, z3, z4, these are known as well as pseudo ranges are being measured, are being observed. So, we know also the pseudo ranges. So, what we can do now, we have got four equations, four unknowns. We can solve it in order to determine ux, ui, uz mean the position here of the receiver. So, this is basically how in case of code based method, the location is determined by the observation by the measurement of pseudo ranges. Now, we are going for the other method as we discussed that other method is the carrier based. Carrier, what is the carrier? Carrier is, we know this code is being modulated on the carrier. There are two carrier waves L1 and L2. And in case of P code also, in case of CA code also, this is modulated on top of the carrier. In the case of carrier based method, the idea is can we use the carrier signal in order to determine the range or the pseudo range again? Is it possible? Now, how is it done? The principle is nearly same as the EDMI. In the case of the EDMI, as we know, we fire, as you can see here now, in case of EDMI, we fire the ledge of pulse, or let us say it is a continuous wave. A continuous wave is fired, which comes back after reflectance, and over here, we measure the phase difference of outgoing and incoming wave. So, we measure the phase difference here, delta phi. If we know the phase difference, if we know the phase difference, I can multiply that by the wavelength in order to convert it into that partial distance. So, how we can write the full distance d now? 
the full distance d between transmitter and the reflector can be written as d is half of n into lambda plus delta phi by 2 pi into lambda. Now, what is n here? Of course, we know lambda is the wavelength which is being used, delta phi is the phase difference, which will remain constant provided d is constant and d is the distance. So, we can guess it very easily here that n is equal to the full number of cycles in between transmitter, reflector and receiver because the signal starts from the transmitter. Now, they are one full wavelength, second full wavelength and so on. Now, it reflects from here. Uh, one more full wavelength, another one, another one. Then at the end of it, it may be full wavelength, it may not be. And that is what is the phase difference. So, we are basically, how we can write the distance? Distance we can write in terms of all the full wavelengths which are there in between as well as the partial one at the end of it. So, this n over here, the n here, represents full wavelengths in between this distance. So, there are methods. We know a method which is called decayed modulation. So, by this decayed modulation, in case of EDMI, we can determine the distance between transmitter and the reflector. Now, this kind of method where our transmitter is sending the signal or the continuous wave and again it is receiving the same. So, the signal is starting from the transmitter, it goes to the reflector and again it is coming back to the receiver here. So, this kind of method we say active method or active ranging system. Now, in the case of the GPS, as we know in the case of the GPS, the idea is we want to determine the range between satellite and the receiver and we know only satellite is sending the signal. There is no signal which is being sent by the receiver. So, the principle of EDMI though it is applicable here, but cannot be used directly in the case of the GPS because unlike EDMI, the receiver is not sending any signal towards the satellite. So, in the case of the GPS, when we are making use of the carrier phase, what we will do, we will apply the passive ranging system. Now, what is this passive ranging system? Well, over here, if this is our satellite, that is the satellite and it is sending a signal, I have shown you by a continuous wave and the receiver receives this. Our aim is we want to find the distance d between these two points or the range. So, again we can write this d as n into lambda plus delta phi 2 pi by lambda. Now, what is this? Over here, delta phi is again the phase difference at receiver. What happens in this case? Those receivers which can which have a facility to receive the carrier phase or other to do the carrier phase ranging. Those receiver have got an oscillator there inside and this oscillator has the facility that it can measure the phase difference between its phase and the phase of the wave which is coming. So, the oscillator which is the quartz crystal oscillator which is sitting there in the receiver can measure the difference between received carrier phase and the phase of the oscillator. So, basically now we are what we are doing, we are again measuring the phase at the oscillator or at the receiver by using the phase of the oscillator and the phase of the coming wave. So, this is the phase difference that we are observing. So, we can write this phase difference over here, but in order to know d, we should again know the value of n. 
that how many full wavelengths are there. This gives the n, 1, 2, and so on, up to n. And then the partial one. This is the partial wavelength, which is corresponding to phase difference. So again, in this case, we need to know n. Measurement of delta phi or the phase difference is possible, and it can be done accurately also. It can be done with an accuracy of 3 to 10 millimeter. Now, one thing, again, Y carrier is better than the coat phase. We know in case of the coat phase, the frequency of the signal is approximately equal to 1 megahertz, while in the case of the carrier, it is approximately 1000 megahertz. So, these are the frequencies of carrier and the CA code signal or the pseudo random code. So, what is the implication of this and how we can say that carrier is more accurate? Well, for this CA 1 megahertz and for carrier 1000 megahertz, if you convert these in corresponding wavelengths. So, to convert it, this wavelength will come out around 30 centimeter or sorry 30 meter 0 0.30 meter while this wavelength it comes out to be 300 meter. We just saw it. So, we can do this computation because we know the relationship between lambda c is mu lambda by using this we can do this computation. Now, what do we observe here? Our accuracy of d, d is n lambda, the so delta phi lambda by 2 pi. So, the accuracy of d, if you see over here, is proportional to lambda as well as proportional to the delta phi. The, how precisely we can observe the phase difference? So, accuracy of D will be governed by this as well as accuracy of D is governed by the wavelength. What is the meaning of this? If we are going for a smaller wavelength, we will have more accurate position. Well, the wavelength in case of CA is 300 meter, while in case of carrier, it is only 30 centimeter. So, what we see? We see a big jump in terms of the accuracy when we are using the carrier. So, this is why as we are seeing earlier also, in case of the code based GPS, the positions are not accurate when we compare them with the carrier based. In case of carrier, of course, there are some disadvantages, but the carrier based GPS positioning is very accurate. Well, still there is a problem. In case of the carrier, this is being measured at the receiver and this is how you know we can write the full equation. The range or the pseudo range now because we are adding the errors here is n lambda delta phi by 2 into lambda. We know lambda because we know what carrier wave we are using. We know delta phi because this is being observed and we can model the errors. But still we do not know anything about n. How to determine the n? What is n? The signal from the satellite here, signal is going to the receiver. Over there, we have got one full wavelength, second full wavelength and then some part which is corresponding to delta phi. But, how to know 
that how many full cycles are there from satellite to the receiver? That's the major question. In case of EDMI, we are using the decade modulation. And there it was possible because the system was active system. But here the ranging is passive system. But still we would like to know number of integer, you know, that's the integer quantity. How many full cycles are of the wavelength in between satellite and the receiver? Delta phi or that partial one is being measured. Now, the answer of that is, we say resolving carrier phase ambiguity. And also this is called integer ambiguity. So basically we go for the method of resolving integer ambiguity. How it is done? This value of n, we want to determine this. There are various algorithms in fact. But the general steps in most of these are we need to provide a priori value of ambiguity parameters. Now what is the meaning of this? To the algorithm which is trying to resolve the ambiguity, we give some initial values. The initial value could be the location where we are standing. For example, there is a location which we know, which we have some idea about. Not accurate, but we have some idea about that location. So we input that initial value. So the algorithm will make use of the initial value and then it will resolve the ambiguity. We will find that value of n. Or maybe we start with the CA code or the P code because we, we have a way in which we can still find the pseudo ranges and the location by using the CA code or the P code though they are errors. But the range which is being given by the CA code or the P code is the initial value for us. Now that initial value goes into the algorithm and using that the ambiguity is resolved. Also there are ways in which dual frequency and best geometry of the satellite is used. So basically by using initial values, known reference point or the code phase should arrange as well as in dual frequency and the best geometry mode, there are algorithms which we are not discussing here which can resolve ambiguity. Okay, once the ambiguity has been resolved, now what is happening here? We have a receiver, it is now logged we say a term called lock. I will write that term here. Locking of a receiver with the satellite. Now what is the meaning of this? The receiver here and the satellite, the moment they are locked means the receiver is observing delta phi, the phase difference, as well as it has now determined the ambiguity. So once this operation is complete, we say the receiver is locked with the satellite. Now, we would like to observe at this point for some long duration in order to get an accurate position. But in between what is happening? Now the satellite is moving. As the satellite is moving, this number of n or the full cycles will not remain same. We can keep observing the delta phi, the phase difference, because this is being done here at the receiver. So this phase difference can be measured continuously. But how about n, which is changing now? So basically, there is again a possibility, as we can see here, after locking, delta phi is being measured continuously. What we do, that's the initial point. At time t is equal to 0, the receiver here has measured now delta phi 1 and this ambiguity means n has been resolved. So that means the lock has been established now. From here to time is t is equal to t1, the satellites moves to a new position. If it is moving there, number of full cycles 
let us say this is now n1 so n will not be equal to n1 rather there will be some extra extra could be positive or negative both there will be some extra cycles here so after resolving the ambiguity this ambiguity parameter or this n remains constant but the receiver also keeps counting these extra cycles so what is happening how the position is being determined the receiver keeps counting the extra cycles that is also possible so now once the ambiguity has been resolved the receiver is locked with the satellite now any movement of the satellite till there is no obstruction till the signals are reaching the receiver the receiver will keep determining the range accurately because it has resolved the ambiguity that means it knows the n it is measuring the delta phi phase difference it is also counting the extra cycles which are being introduced there now that was n1 minus n so by doing this the receiver is able to determine the accurate range well now we have seen both the methods the code based and the carrier based what we will try to do we will try to compare them now here in the comparison first the code based methods which is also called code phase based ranging the important thing about this is it is simple also these methods are fast because there is no question of resolving the ambiguity here there is no need of initial value again because there is we need not to resolve the ambiguity here however these are less accurate we have already seen why they are less accurate for the ca code the wavelength was corresponding to 300 meter so because of this reason these are less accurate when we compare it with the carrier based now in carrier phase base ranging a carrier phase gps this of course more accurate we'll see these accuracy values also in a while what can be achieved by gps but at the same time these are complex complex means now we have to take into account the phase difference we have to take into account the ambiguity so these are comp very very complex also in order to resolve the ambiguity we have to wait so we have these are the time consuming methods and anywhere in between if the lock of the receiver is broken from the satellite again we'll have to restart the process so again that ambiguity will not need to be resolved in some of the methods then also we need an idea about the initial value so this is briefly the comparison of code phase gps and carrier phase gps now we would like to see what are the kinds of gps receivers how we can classify them when you go to the market to purchase the gps receivers you will find the gps receivers which are so small so cheap that they, you can put them in your watch also they are, and you, some receivers may cost you only 10 to 15000 rupees while at the other end there are receivers which are larger in size which are more complex in operation which are very costly you will have to pay them around 15000 to 15 lakh rupees for one receiver so there are varieties of receivers which are available in the market how we can classify them because this classification is important depending upon your application what application you are using your gps for accordingly you will take a decision okay i need of this kind of gps so what is the classification how we can categorize them for number 1 is the code phase receiver means those receivers which are only for code signal these may be either for p code or for ca code 
Of course, we know from the code phase GPS that now these receivers will be less accurate, but the surveying will be faster. So, if we are just doing a GIS data updation at once to 50,000 scale, we would like to go for a receiver like this because we don't need a good accuracy of the data here at this scale and we can carry out our work very fast. The other category of the receivers is the carrier phase. Those receivers which are making use of carrier signal. Now carrier means these could be those which can use either single frequency or maybe dual frequency. Now those with the single frequency they use L1, they are again in comparison to the dual frequency they are cheaper but we know why we use L1 and L2 together by observing their relative delay it is possible to eliminate ionospheric error. If you are using only single frequency, the ionospheric error cannot be eliminated here. However, in case of dual frequency, both L1 and L2 frequencies are being used and this can now eliminate also the ionospheric error. Of course, the dual frequency one are expensive. Then we can have another classification of the receivers which is based on data use. Now there may be some receivers which are using only CA code. There may be some which are using CA code as well as L1 or the carrier phase, carrier wave. There could be some which are using CA code, L1 carrier as well as L2 carrier. Also there may be a few which are using CA code, P code as well as L1 and L2. So depending what kind of facility is there, the receivers are classified and this is how the receivers are available in market. One more classification and this is based on the channel. Now what is channel actually? For a receiver, once it looks or it gets locked with the satellites, each satellite is sending its signal. So we have at any time the signal coming from all the satellites, those satellites which are visible to us, which are visible to the receiver. Now the question is, does the electronic of the receiver support simultaneous observation of all these signals or not? There are some receivers which can observe or which can capture all the signals which are coming from the satellites. There are few which have only one channel. So accordingly we can classify the receivers as multi channels. You know they may have 8 number of channels, 12 number of channels, 24 number of channels. So they can simultaneously lock with all these satellites and collect their data simultaneously. However, we may have some receivers which are sequential. Sequential receivers means they are, if there are five number of satellites, so this receiver will capture the signal from these in a sequential mode, one by one, and then it computes its location. Of course, if it is sequential, it will be time consuming. means we will need to give more time in order to compute the position as well as the position will be less accurate. But the receiver will be cheaper. One more classification which is possible is of integrated GPS receiver. Now what is the meaning of integrated? Now in market there are GPS receivers which are coming like a GPS receiver can only collect the data from Navstar. There could be another GPS which can collect the data from Navstar as well as the GLONASS. 
there will be now the more GPS receivers. Some GPS receivers are already coming in market which have the facilities to collect the data from Galileo as well. So, how or to what all GPS systems the receiver can collect the data or can collect the signal in order to compute the location depending these GPS systems we can again classify the GPS receivers. Next after knowing about the GPS receivers their types we would like to see about the GPS positioning approaches. Now so far we have understood broadly the methods with the GPS uses in order to compute the location. We have also seen how the differential GPS is carried out and how it can improve the accuracy. Now we would like to see in field when we are using the GPS actually what are the various possible modes. Again the list which I am giving you here is not a very wide list, it is not exhaustive. Only some ideas about the various modes in which the GPS can be used there in the field. Okay, out of those modes, we can use the GPS for point positioning or for relative positioning, for static positioning or for kinematic positioning or also for real time positioning or the post mission positioning mission positioning. What are these? In point positioning, this is also called single point positioning or absolute positioning. Now, what is this? We have already discussed this principle by observing the range edge, the pseudo range edge or maybe in the carrier wave also, this point positioning can be done either way either in the carrier phase or in the core phase. So, basically what we are doing, we are observing these ranges and we know the locations of the satellites and we can compute the coordinates of a single point. In the case of the relative positioning, we can eliminate now the error. So, in case of relative positioning, what is being done, we have a known location here. For this known location, we know its coordinates x, y, z in our coordinate system. There is a position here for which we want to compute the coordinates and as we saw earlier, we were saying it as rover. So, for this location, we want to compute the coordinates here. So, what we do? We do the relative positioning. Relative means at the reference receiver also, we are receiving the signal and from here we are computing the correction. So, this correction is being computed for all the satellites and then this correction is being transmitted to the rover or the other receiver where we want to compute the position and the rover is basically observing the times T1, T2, T3 and T4 for the signals which are coming from these four satellites and then it applies the correction as it should be T4, T3, T2 and this is T1 here. So, this is how the corrections are being applied in the times which are being observed. So, by knowing these correct times, the position over here can be determined. So, this is how we did the DGPS also and this kind of positioning we say relative positioning where the positions are being determined of an unknown points with respect to receiver at a known point. So, this is the relative positioning. Another way is we can say the static or kinematic. Static means our GPS receiver is stationary, it is not moving. We keep it here for half an hour, for 5 minutes, for 10 minutes and we determine the position here. 
but some applications will demand that the GPS receiver should move. For example, if the receiver is fitted in an aircraft or the GPS receiver is fitted in a car or the GPS receiver is with an individual who is moving. In all these cases, the position which is being determined for the receiver is the kinematic. Another way of positioning, we have already discussed this, is the real-time positioning. Means, we are computing the position in real-time. Now, it could be for single point positioning, also for relative positioning. If we have a single point positioning, means we have our, our receiver here. And the moment these signals are reaching, from the satellite. At the same time, I am computing the position, position of the receiver. So, this is the real time. In case of differential positioning or the relative positioning, we know the point here, we know the coordinates here. This is the reference receiver. And the, this reference receiver is computing the corrections. And these corrections are being transmitted to the rover. And the rover makes use of these corrections and then computes its position there in the field itself in real time. So, this is the real time relative positioning. Well, what we can do? All these computations we can do later on. For example, the single receiver here, it is collecting the data. It is not doing any computation. It is not computing its position, position. Rather, later on, we go to the office and then we compute the position. Similarly, in the case of the relative also, it is collecting all the data and this is also collecting all the data. Data means the signals and all the computations means the ranges, the time corrections and applying these time corrections at the receiver, all these are being done in the office. So, that is the post mission. Now, in the case of real time, there is one problem. We saw that problem earlier also, that was called the latency. But more than that, one more problem is there in the case of real time. This is the real time positioning will use broadcast ephemerides. What is this? Broadcast ephemerides. We know in order to locate or in order to do the GPS, we need to know exactly where the satellites are located. This can be predicted by knowing the orbital characteristics, but they are perturbations. So, what is being done? The ground control station is observing the satellites and keeps measuring those perturbations. So, right now, for example, the navigation data which is coming from the satellite has got the predicted position as well as the perturbations. It is there, but that is the broadcast ephemeris. Broadcast means it is not the actual, it is not the predicted one. Using the past data, how the perturbations are there, using the past data, the ground control is extrapolating the positions. Okay, today at this particular time, where the satellites are, this particular position is a predicted one based on the past 24 hours or 48 hours of the data about the satellite actual position. So, this predicted one is being transmitted through the satellite along with the signal. So, this is the broadcast ephemeride. So, obviously, the broadcast ephemeride is not the actual perturbation there in the satellite position. So, this is not accurate. So, in the case of the real-time GPS, we are using the broadcast fMRI. So, there are chances that there will be error. But however, in the case of the post-mission processing, now we have come back to the laboratory. You log on to a site and from that website, we can download the actual fMRIs or which we say the precise fMRIs. So, these precise ephemerides are available from a website. What I can do? I had done the GPS survey in field five days back. Now, I after a week, I log on to the site and in the site, the pre precise locations 
of the satellite at that point of time are given. So what we can do? We are downloading the correct positions, the actual positions of the satellite. So these are more accurate obviously. So in the case of the post processing, our locations which we are determining are more accurate. Finally, as we can see here, we are trying to give now some nominal positional accuracies in the GPS. So please mind it, now we are not using a single GPS, rather these accuracies are for DGPS mode. Now in this DGPS, how we are writing these accuracies? We are first writing about the receivers. What are the types of the receivers? And then this is accuracy at 95 percent. And we are giving the accuracies for code based and as well as for carrier based. First of all, if we have a low cost GPS, so naturally the low cost GPS will not support carrier. So it will not support this. So in case of carrier, there is no accuracy value here. But with the low cost GPS, if you are doing the DGPS in code phase, the accuracy which we can get is 3 to 5 meter. This is very good, quite good accuracy in order to update GIS database at middle level scales. Well, if we have a geodetic quality GPS, means it has 24 channels, it has both the frequency L1, L2 and we are doing the static observation. If you are doing this static observation with the geodetic quality GPS, this is the best possible way. And if you are using only code based, this is the accuracy which we can get. 0 0.3 to 1 meter. Now the most important one of them. Now over here, this is the best possible case which can be there. What this case is, we are using a geodetic quality GPS which has 24 channels or large number of channels. It is using dual frequency, both the frequencies so the ionospheric errors can be eliminated. We are working in static mode we are not moving. So, static means we are observing for long duration of time. So, we have better accuracy again. Then again, we are using the carrier phase. So, this is the best possible combination which we can say dual frequency, carrier phase, static observation with large number of channels. So, best possible case and the accuracy which we can achieve is 2 mm plus minus 1 ppm. Now what we are indicating by this accuracy, the way we have written it here, we know already when we are talking about EDMI, we discussed how this, you know, what is this way of writing the accuracy. Over here 2 mm is because of the instrument. So, the instrument, the instrument results in this 2 mm accuracy while this 1 ppm, it means 1 per part million is related to the baseline distance. The baseline distance means we are doing the DGPS. Of course, see the carrier phase, dual frequency, multi-channel, static and relative positioning. That is the best possible combination. So, when once we, we are doing the relative positioning, we means we have a baseline between these two reference and the rover. So, this one part per million means we will have an accuracy of one in one million baseline. So, whatever the length in one kilometer, one millimeter. So, that is the second part of this accuracy. So, that is the best possible accuracy which we can achieve. Well, third, we are doing the real-time kinematic 
it can be done real time kinematic is a survey which can be done only in the carrier phase so this is not applicable here so what is the meaning of this real time kinematic real time kinematic is it's a relative positioning we are computing the position in real time and we are using the carrier phase we are using the geodetic quality receivers so now the movement is possible it's not a static for those applications where movement is there in this case the position can be determined with 10 to 15 millimeter accuracy and this is important if you are putting this kind of gps on an aircraft the location of the aircraft can be determined with you know 2 cm 3 cm that kind of accuracy and this is highly useful for airborne surveys when we are using the camera put on an aircraft or some other sensors put on the aircraft we need to know there the location of the aircraft so the gps in rtk mode is helping us and of course in these cases we are doing the post processing not the because in this case basically in this case we are doing the post processing not the real time processing so what we have seen in this lecture now we talked about what are the methods of measurement in the gps code based and the phase based we saw some formulation in the case of the code based and also now in the case of the carrier based in the case of the carrier phase gps we measured the phase difference at the receiver but there was a problem of ambiguity that was the integer ambiguity and there are methods by which this integer ambiguity can be resolved we found that the carrier base is more accurate than the code base then we saw the various types of receivers the receivers which are available in the market receivers can be classified depending how many channels are there depending the kind of the signal which they can process which they can receive then finally we saw some field based methods you know the static versus kinematic real time versus post mission processing so these are some methods which are actually used once we are doing the survey in the field so we end our this video lecture here thank you